started unplanned. Our journey started in 1984. After we finished our studies, uh, means I got a job in German company working in one of the world's biggest chemical company, and my wife, who had done a PhD in genetic engineering, was working in the United Nations. And we went to an NRI conference, and that's where we met Rajiv Gandhi. My wife, who was a foreigner, she was a Malaysian, done a PhD in genetic engineering. She realized that India was making the same mistake like West. We wanted to make progress at any cost, and pollution was a part of a price we make for the progress. So she started an NGO called Ecocenter Iknir, called International Center for Networking, Ecology, Education, and Reintegration, to create awareness that 70% of the people live in villages. So we settled in Baroda, then in Valsad, and that's how the journey began. Now, when having joined the uh, NGO, I started going out with her. And what she was doing was she was telling people not to cut forest. Because India, when we got independence, we were 26% or 36% forest. And by the time, in 45 years, we had only 6% forest left. Now it's even less. And she realized that there was a direct connection between environment, the trees, and the rain. For three years, it had not rained in Gujarat. So she started going and telling people not to cut forest. And I had to go and listen to what she was talking. And one day, a lady got up and said, Madam, it's very easy for you to say, don't do this, don't do that. But don't talk about problems. We have enough problems. Show us a solution. So that's how I got into solar energy. Now I had to solve the problem of cooking without using wood. I looked around and found a technology called box cooker. The problem with this solar cooker is that it cannot fry, it cannot make chapati, uh, it cooks very slowly. So we know that it works, but we, we are not able to use it. And one of my colleague, Dr. Zeifert, he had developed a technology called parabolic cooker. Where you can put a cooking vessel into the focus. If you put a cooking vessel, the temperature is 250 degrees centigrade. Now you can fry, you can make chapatis, you can do everything. So we started our own company called Gadia Solar, which is on the top, to ma manufacture the systems and offer the solution and make the money, and then money can go back to the society where we are make making money from. So that was our first journey to social internship. The technology was very successful. The first people who purchased the cooker were thrilled. But very quickly, we realized that it was a very limited market. The dichotomy was that the people who could afford this technology, the middle class, the rich, did not need it because they had LPG, they had electricity to cook with. And the people who wanted it, the poor, could not afford it because such a cooker cost about 8,000 rupees, which is about three months' salary for a poor man. So we realized that the technology doesn't have to be functional. It has also to be affordable. We were no Bill Gates that we could afford subsidize this. So we said, OK, how do we do it? So as an entrepreneur, your first challenge is create a product, and it should be also, it should have its own market. It should be standing on its own feet, not depending on subsidy or something. So we said, OK, we'll shift the target. We'll, instead of making a domestic cooking, we'll commit, commit to community cooking. And then the lady said, oh, we want to use a cooker, but the problem is we don't want to go into the sun. And one lady very provocatively said, you know what, Deepak, you are a typical man. You all want to sit in the comfort of your air-conditioned room, and you want us, the woman, to go into the sun. If you really want to help us, bring the sun in the kitchen. If I go sun, I become black, I don't get a husband. You know, at that time, black was not beautiful. But now it is, thank God. <laughs> so again, I went back to Germany, spoke to an inventor, and brought a technology where you could do exactly what the lady wanted. So we have a parabolic dish here now, reflecting the light in the kitchen. Now you can see the lady is very happy, smiling, now because she can cook in the comfort of the kitchen. And she asked the price, and the cooker, which was costing 8,000 rupees, is costing 80,000 rupees. So then we say, OK, this is not a domestic cooker. This is a community cooker. So we designed it in such a way that it can move along with the sun. Like it has a tracking system, where it is a clockwork where the dish keeps on moving along with the sun. And with one dish, you can cook 400 people. And we started targeting midday meal program, because government was giving uh, solar cookers to schools so that they don't have to buy wood and the food uh, would, would be cooked. So here is a solar system where you have got two dishes reflecting light in the kitchen. And you can see the kitchen here. The uh, flame, what you see, is a solar flame. The temperature is 550 degrees centigrade. And with this small lever on the left, you can actually control the light that is coming in. So if it is half open, you only half the light is coming. If it is fully closed, no light is coming. So just like gas, you can do high flame, on flame, low flame, everything just like you are cooking with gas, but it's cooking with sun. So people said, look, this cooker is good, but we want to cook at night. So we have to find a solution. This is what in management we call feedback loop. You need to understand. You need to get feedback from the people, the user, who have answered. They don't have solutions, but they know what they want. So we developed a technology where you can now actually store the energy into a metal block, heat the temperature to 550 degrees centigrade. Now you can cook in the morning and cook at night. And life was going great till one day we got a phone call from Brahma Kumari and said, we want to cook for 1,200 people. I said, great, it's a great business for me. Buy 10 dishes or 12 dishes from me, and you can cook for 1,200 people. And they said, no, we cannot do that, because if you buy 12 dishes, we require 12 cooking vessels, 12 cooks. We require a very large cooker. Why don't you put the dish on the terrace and bring the light at one point? 
We will bring heat in the kitchen. And that's how the first world solar steam cooking system was developed, where we now put two dishes in such a way that the sunlight is falling on this dish, reflecting on the tank here, and the sunlight is falling on this dish, deflecting onto this point. So this is a part of two parabolas with the focus here. And we have multiple dishes. And because of the high temperature, the water in this tank becomes steam. It gets at, uh, into the header pipe, become, it gets accumulated, and then the steam is sent into the kitchen. Now you can cook in the comfort of the kitchen for 1,200 people with solar energy. And now advantage was not only are you able to cook with solar energy, it is very quick, it is very convenient, it is very comfortable, it is very hygienic. Now you can use stainless steel vessels and all. So suddenly we realized that there was a new technology which was never used before, that was solar steam cooking system. Our company went on becoming the world's biggest company. And this is the system which was installed in uh, Shirdi Temple. This is the world's biggest solar cooker which cooks for 50,000 people every day. Yeah? So there are seven three dishes producing steam and then steam is piped to the kitchen and you can cook 32 kilograms of rice in one vessel in 12 minutes. And 32 kilograms is equivalent to 600 people food. So you can now imagine you know, the scale at which the food, when the food is cooked. We also did the world's highest solar cooker. This is for the Indian army in Ladakh. And then the motto was, because army doesn't carry about money, because army has a lot of money available to them because they are defending us. But for them, it was also important that they protect environment. Because the local people said, look, you are coming here to protect us, but you are spoiling the environment. So why can't you use solar energy? So they went for a solar cooking system, which was the world's highest. But the question was, can a solar system work in winter? Can a system work when there is minus 15 degrees centigrade? In Ladakh, it is minus 15 degrees centigrade. And this is a photograph which shows, actually, this is a misconception. We think that a solar system works on heat or ambient temperature. It's not true. A solar system works on radiation. And even at minus 15 degrees, actually, the radiation is better because there are no clouds being built. And now you can, you're able to cook for uh, 500 Indian soldiers at minus 15 degrees centigrade. Then we had come across a statistics which I could not Im imagine. It said that 3.2 million women and children die every year because of the smoke in the kitchen. And I was, as I said, I was a city boy. I could not imagine how can anyone die because of the smoke. Because there was no smoke when my mother cooked, because she used to cook with LPG. But now that I was in villages, I saw, and we came across 50% of the world population, even now, cooks on open fire. And when you cook on open fire, you see the kitchens are like this. There is a smoke, there is soot, there is kerosene, there is carbon monoxide. And no wonder that 3.2 million women and children die every year. The same, and this is the kitchen of the Indian army. So you can imagine even the Indian army which can build bridge in one day, was having a kitchen which was like 5,000 years old and made no improvement. Now the same kitchen when it became the solar, you can see it is now it is clean, hygienic, quick and all. So now suddenly we, were, we are not talking about saving money. We are not talking about saving environment, you're also talking about saving health. We wanted to do something for the society. Money was important so that we are not dependent on someone, but we also wanted to do something for the world. And we started looking at the whole world poverty. Who is poor? Why is India poor? How can a country like India be poor? A country which is such a great country with such great climate, with such skills we have, and our old history, civilization. Why it is poor? Who is poor? And to our surprise, the answer was a farmer is poor. And it was again funny, how can a man who grows food go hungry? That means something is fundamentally wrong. And we realize that a farmer goes poor or is hungry because he produces a perishable product. If he doesn't sell it by evening or next day, he has to throw it away. So it is a middleman who, make, a middleman who makes the money. So now they, they say that if a farmer sells a product, he only gets 7 to 10% of the money and price. About 20% goes into transporting to cities, 30-40% goes into storage, and then 20-30% goes to the middleman. So it's the middleman who makes the farmer. So we said, how can we change that? So, so here you see the same thing is happening here, what uh, Sola Cooker was doing, but instead of cooking, what we are doing is we are producing potato chips. Now you can just imagine if a farmer sells potatoes, he gets about 10 to 20 rupees per kilogram. But the moment he converts that potato into potato chips, he gets about 400 to 600 rupees per kilogram. Yeah, that is what the cost of lay of what we eat in a small packet is. And now we can do it at the village level. Here is value addition, there is employment. Everything happens at the village level. So you are not only now uh, helping remove poverty, but you are helping them stay in the village, have a very respectful life. And then that suddenly started all, uh, uh, taking forward to make bread, biscuit, cakes, everything and all, even water. You'll be surprised that uh, the, they say that the first and the second world war was because of oil. But the third world war is going to be because of water. So you can actually do desalination. What is rain? Rain is nothing but sun falling onto the sea and creating uh, clouds, uh, water evaporating and becoming clouds and coming down again. So with solar energy, you can do so much more, not just cooking. But 
the place where I come from, Munisya Ashram, one day called me and said, you know what, Deepak? We are a hospital. We are a cancer hospital. We, we spend about 4 crore rupees every year for electricity. We have a 600 ton air conditioning. Can we do it with solar? And I said, but with solar, you can only do heat. You cannot do cooling. And they said, actually, you can. Because they had a wood-fired boiler in which they were producing steam. And with the steam, they were running an air conditioning plant called vapor absorption chiller, which runs on steam, not on electricity. So I said, look, I don't know about technology, but if you want steam, I can replace the wood-fired steam with solar steam, and you can actually use that for air conditioning. And that's how the India's first 100-ton air conditioning plant came up, where we are now not heating, but cooling. Now, just because you are young and because you are, want to become an entrepreneur, just imagine all the things I've talked about, the technologies which were developed, tested, proven, there is a market for it. But there are not enough manufacturers. So now government is giving support to people like you all to go and become solar engineers. Surya Mitras, technicians, designers, installers, manufacturers. India has got 550,000 villages. And in each and every village, we require drinking water systems, we require wastewater operation systems, we require bakeries, we require uh, air conditioning plants, cold storages. So just see there is an untapped market. And for me, the biggest surprise came when one day, because every time somebody will come to us to show the power of sun, we'll piece of, put a piece of wood into the focus of the dish, and the wood will start burning. And like everyone, they will say, wow, and walk away. But an old man who could not read and write came and said, wow, Deepak, why is it possible to burn a dead body with a solar system? And like I was stunned. I said, are you crazy? I am finding it difficult to convert people from normal cooking to solar cooking, and you're talking about solar crematorium. If it doesn't work, they will put me along with the solar crematorium. I said, forget it, it's not, it's not going to work. It, it, technically, it will work, but people will not accept it. He went away, came back after a few months, and said, yeah, Deepak Bhai, this is the order, uh, order of six lakh rupees as a check, and please make a solar crematorium. And I said, it's not about money. If there was a market, I would have done it myself, because I'm a businessman. But I don't think people will accept it. He took out a piece of paper with 84 people in the list, saying, these are the people who have agreed to do a solar crematorium day. And I was stunned, and suddenly, I, it clicked. I said, this is the best marketing guy in the world. He has sold a product that does not exist. Huh? A man who cannot read and write has sold a product which does not exist. He has collected money for it. So I asked him, I said, how did you do that? And this is where he actually showed me something which was very important, which we all miss. There is a big difference between information, knowledge, and wisdom. This man could not read and write, but he was a wise man. He said, Deepak Bhai, the problem with you technocrat is you always talk head to head. You try to convince people. I did very sim something very different. I made a small model, went to Puttaparthi, to Satya Sai Baba, and told in my village there is not enough wood. Now, Baba, being a spiritual leader, understood the power of sun. He said, Tathastu. Now, because it is blessed, there is no argument. <laughs> so it's very important. You need to understand the language of the people, not Gujarati, Hindi, Marathi, but there is a connect. If you understand, if you talk to them with their feelings, their understanding, it works. And so that's why it's very important to connect science and spirituality, especially in a country like India. So this is the world's first solar crematorium, which is being installed in the Munisiva Ashram. We have a 50 square meter dish reflecting the light into the body here, and the temperature is 1,200 degrees centigrade. Now just imagine the implication. We are 700 million Hindus, and each and every body requires 200 to 300 kilograms of wood to burn. So just multiply that 700 million into 200 kilograms. There is not enough wood in our country to burn all the Hindus. So what do we do? We have electrical crematoriums. We have grass crematoriums. We have got Varanasi where people put the body away to the river. So just see the implication that it can have. A simple technology, a simple idea. Someone who could not read it, I thought about it. And now it's on the way. My wife also was my anchor. I was a dreamer, and she was grounded to the reality. She was a foreigner, but she was more Indian than me. So she told me, you know what, Deepak, again, you're doing all great projects, air conditioning, crematorium, all very exciting, all technology. But what about my poor men? We came to the, the poor of the world, and I still see my woman carrying 200 kilograms or 50 kilograms of wood on the wo and going into the forest and bringing here. I want to help them. And then we heard about someone called Muhammad Yunus. Muhammad Yunus is a guy in Bangladesh who created a concept of microfinance. And he got world Nobel Prize for that. He, the belief is that a poor man is an honest man, he will pay. Malayas of the world will go away to England, but a poor man stays in villages and pays back the money because he has a lot of peer pressure and he's an honest man. So he had proven that if you give money to poor men, it will come back. 99.9% .9 of the money was recovered by his bank. So we said, okay, now that we are rich, uh, or relatively rich, we can now give the cooker to the poor in installment. If a rich man can buy a solar a TV or a car in installment, why can't a poor man get a solar cooker in installment? So we went to the village and said, look, you wanted a solar cooker, you couldn't afford it. This is the solar cooker, we are giving it to you. And you pay every month 100 rupees. 
And to our surprise, village said, sorry, Deepak, we will not give you 100 rupees. And again, we were shocked. I said, we always thought the poor are the good people. How can we give you free? We cannot give you free. We don't have that type of money. And they tried to explain me. You know, in English, there's a very nice proverb. It says, only the guy who wears the shoes knows where it pinches. You have to be poor to understand the problems of poor. So he explained to me, look, why should I replace something which is free? For us, the wood is free for something where we have to pay. So I tried the emotional card. I said, oh, your, your poor wife has to carry the weight from forest. He says, my wife, why are you worried about my wife? For them, weight is not a problem. For them, being in the sun is not a problem. For them, money is the problem. So I realized that microfinance will not work. So we had to create a new concept. And we have converted six villages into India, into smoke-free village, where the whole village cooks on solar cooker. But it was not introduced as solar cooker. What we realized was that a poor man cannot afford it. But we all want money. We all are against materialism, but we all want material. So we said, OK, this is not a solar cooker. This is an income generation tool. So in this village, we have given solar cooker on microfinance. And we have taught them how to make bread, biscuit, jalebi, gatia, pakoda, water, everything they can, and they can sell. And the slogan is, you pay from your profit, not from your pocket. That is acceptable to them. <laughs> and you know, you have, we, we underestimate the power of the poor. We underestimate their survival skill. I got a phone call from a village. Said, Deepak, please come. There is a lady who's misusing the cooker. I went there, and I saw the cooker was being used for ironing. I gave her a prize. That is innovation for me. She realized that if everyone starts making the rice and dal and vegetables, then there will be a big supply and less demand. I can use a solar cooker for making iron in the cloth. So I think if poor are smart enough, they have a lot of innovations into them. They are survivors. And she found out a way by which she can still make money. She makes 100 rupees per day by ironing clothes with a solar cooker. So let us not uh, underestimate the power. There is a very nice proverb which says, if you give someone a fish, you have helped him for a day. But if you teach him how to fish, you have helped him for the life. I think that is what is empowerment about. Uh, the concept became so popular that Bill Clinton uh, invited us to Hong Kong in global uh, clean Clinton Global Initiative uh, and uh, wanted us to spread this technology world over. And we are working together with this Munisya Ashram and many, many NGOs because now it's not just about technology. Previously, it was all about engineering. Now it is about social engineering. We need to understand people. We need to understand the pain points. We need to understand what's going to be acceptable to them. We need to show them that nothing is free in their life. They will have to pay because very often, the moment you go to poor, he says, oh, I'm poor, I cannot afford it. That means it is his right to get it free. And we told them, no, you will not give you because you are poor. We will empower you. We will teach you how to make money, and you can pay back. And because you are paying back, you are going to help the other poor. Give him that pride, give him the technology. We as technocrats only create solutions for the rich, because only rich can afford them. But we need to go back to villages, get connected to the problems of the real world, and try to help them, solve them. And this is where a lot of engineers have to come. Engineering and social engineering have to go hand in hand. Together, I'm sure we will be able to do it. Thank you very much, TEDx. Thank you for the GLA. <laughs> yes,